Hey, I'm glad you all uh, stuck around. Thank you very much. So I'm Tom, um, and I run this place that you're in now, and I built the sound system that you see about you, which we use for a lot of fundraising events. We use it for a, a thing called Cosmic Slop, and that's what the sound system's named after, Cosmic Slop. And, uh, and that's uh, something that we do. We get a lot of, a lot of DJs coming to play who, who want to... You know, they want to help a good cause. They want to do something for, for young people, but they also want to play on a sound system that is, uh, that's different. And that's the main thing, different to what's available commercially out there in your clubs, at festivals and things like that. There's very few things like this. And it was inspired by the old American sound systems from maybe the late 70s, early 80s, um, which is a particular, for me, someone who's studied music production. I love studio stuff. I love the synthesizers and uh, tape machines. And I love fixing them and I love using them and I love the music that came from those processes. And, and to me, the sound system's an extension of that. And f that era of, um, as a geek, as someone who's really into the technology, I find that era very interesting because people put a lot of effort into achieving their goals, the aesthetics they wanted to achieve. And, and I found it very interesting and inspiring to look at a lot of the individuals that were working in that time frame in America, in New York particularly, that was kind of the epicenter uh, in the late 70s. Richard Long, yeah, exactly. So he's the guy who famously installed the Paradise Garage sound system and, and, and lots of other stuff. He was a, a key figure. Um, you know, uh, before him, maybe, you know, like, or a, a contemporary of his, Ma Mancuso, who was working with Alex Rosner. Um, and, of course, the Gallery Sound System, as well as the Paradise Garage, and that's a, a much smaller club in New York, and that opened, I don't know, was that, like, 73 or something, 1973? And, in fact, they had these very same design here of speakers, these white ones that you see. For me, just being a kid at that time, you know, I was like, it was at university, I was just thinking, reading about it, and really just felt inspired by the extent that these people would go to, to achieve something, and the fact that it could have an influence still. And of course, as well, we don't, we don't have that in England so much, yeah? We don't have a history of that sort of thing. We've got a different kind of history, and part of that was dub sound systems as well. For me, a big influence was Iration Steppers and all the amazing dub artists that they brought up to Leeds, like Abashanti, Jashaka, Tubbies, things like that. And, and hearing that style of sound system and then reading about another style of sound system that was much more um, about hi-fi reproduction, about getting deeper into the music, not, not being battered by it or... <laughs> um, but really like uh, a different type of relationship with sound systems. So I was, I was reading about that type of thing as well. And, and I thought, you know, I'm going to go build a sound system. And I, and I, and I did. And uh, I was a bit disappointed with my university course, I remember. And, and I quit. And I just said, I'm going to go build a sound system, which was a bit, you know. <laughs> and I think, uh, yeah, I had to learn a lot of joinery. I, you know, thank God for YouTube. That's all I'll say. You know, because you just look stuff up. There's someone who's probably done something similar. There's a lot of helpful people online. And so, you know, I'm always an advocate of people learning for themselves, you know, and empowering themselves to find out how to do what they want. But it's quite a particular thing building old sound systems like this because people just stopped doing it a while back, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, so just feeling like I could go out and, and, and learn stuff. In fact, I didn't say go out, I stayed at home and I just got online. And, and there, was, um, there was a forum built by a, a DJ called Francois Kevorkian, who's a big old school New York guy, um, who was like a massive influence for me from, from when I was young as a DJ. And he's got a record label called Wave Music. And there was a, a part of the forum there called something like Tech Heads or something like that. It was a, a bulletin board forum as part of the website. And, um, yeah, going on there and meeting really, like, eccentric characters from New York who were knowledgeable about this type of stuff, and they'd lived with the heritage of that for the last you know, four decades. 
Um, that's not something I experienced going to clubs when I was a kid here in London. You know, maybe Ministry of Sound, you know, at times has had a nice sound there. Going to, going to hear D David Mancuso DJ in London, you know, from 1990-something, 2000, I can't remember when it was. Massive influence as well, because, you know, to hear someone just be so obsessive over detail, and it's not just, oh, yeah, that'll do, or that goes loud, that's good. You know, I like that as well, but to hear someone who was just willing to spend a grand on some cartridge and just strip everything back. His, his whole thing was like taking the ego of the DJ out of the uh, situation, you know? So the DJ can't mess the music up. The DJ can't express their will over the music. They can't edit it or change it. He plays it from start to end. Doesn't even EQ. You know, not, no changes. So it's just the artist's original intent. And I found that really interesting because what I'd had before that is like, House DJs who mix everything so they're editing straight away, who 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 EQ stuff, which I do, I'm guilty of that. You know, or dub DJs who are singing over records with effects, stopping everything every two seconds, restarting it. Love that as well. But it was really interesting to me to see someone really focus in on their love of, of that music, you know, um, as opposed to their love of themselves when they're DJing. <laughs> Which, you know, I, I, I feel guilty of that when I DJ, you know? It is, a, it is an act of sort of arrogance. You should be putting the music on and just letting everyone enjoy it for how it is sometimes, I feel, you know? I guess, you know, I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about how the sound system's put together. That's going to be a little bit geekier now, though. But um, I think most people think that building speakers is actually really, really hard work. And uh, there's some... some magic to it, but really it is just joinery. Yeah, it's just, yeah, glue and screws and things like that, clamps. Um, and that's the way things used to be done, and now maybe they're not done so much. It'd be done with plastic and molding and fiberglass. But, you know, for me, I love, I love the way all those old speakers sound. Uh, it's, it's amazing, you know. So that's, that's these things here. And the, these designs, these white speakers, that's probably from the late 50s, that design. And these were designed originally to go into cinemas. And they were called voice of theater speakers. And uh, yeah, so we're talking about something there that's probably, in principle, half a century old in, 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 in the theory of its design. Is it a lot of fun moving well, they don't move much, but uh, I'd hate to do that, yeah, because they don't even have handles. I guess I always thought I'd cross that bridge when I come to it. But you know, we've, we've used it here for a decade, and it's been you know, it's been pretty nice to have it here most of the time. But we've got like a winch thing that helps move it all and things like that, yeah. And then um, the bits you see on, on top of these and behind you as well, you see these big slanty, platey things. They're called acoustic lenses and they do the mid-range. So 900 hertz up to 8K, something like that. So that's most of your vocal range. Yeah, so these are built... The design of these white speakers is a company called Altec um, in, in America. And one of the guys who set that up made a, I think it was called Altec Lansing. And the guy who was Lansing was James B. Lansing. And he set up a famous company called JBL, which I'm sure some people are familiar with. The pretty ubiquitous across, uh, ubiquitous across the, the globe, you know? Um, yeah, so, and, and these slant plate horns that you just asked if they were vintage, they're JBL, and they were probably made in the 70s or early 80s. Um, and, and they're really way a, a way of smoothing the sound out. So it's, um, it's about coverage. You know, a, a lot of venues you might go to, you can move around the room and things really sound different, but what you want is something that's just comfortable wherever you are, and these kind of horns like this help achieve that. And then... Um, just below them, you've got these tweeters, um, which just do the high end. So that's all the, the detail in the drums, for instance, or the sort of like sibilance, you know, where people are like, Sss, that sort of noise in the vocals. That's going to come out of these tweeters. And also, these tweeters up here in the middle, um, which 
do the same thing again, but it's just extra reinforcement. And the DJ has control over them and can turn them up separate from the rest of the sound system. So you can get some real drama in there. And that's something that the guy you mentioned, Richard Long, he, I think he really developed, or fame, he, he got the credit for it anyway, of, of developing that system when it was called a Richard Long crossover. And it, a lot of DJs from, from our, our side of the, the world don't quite get how it works, but the Americans love that stuff and that's their heritage. And I borrowed that sort of idea that you could have extra reinforcement and so you can get extra bass and extra tweeters. And that's also you know, really similar to the Jamaican sound system way of actually the DJ, the selector, the controller, having control over the actual speakers and the way the sound's distributed in your sound system and not just control over the main master audio output. I don't know if that's that. It just, it just gives, it gives, them a, it gives the DJ or the person in control a bit more credit for knowing what they're doing and can achieve. And if you hear a really good DJ with a sound system like this, it is amazing, the drama and the dynamics that they can get in extra. So at this point, has anyone got any sort of questions about the construction of the sound system? Anything that they want to know about building it or anything like that? Yeah, it's, um, it's plywood, basically, you know, like birch ply and marine grade if you can get it. Just, and that's really important to get as nice a stuff as you can. Um, in fact, I'm, just, I'm building some more of these speakers right now for someone else and they're gonna be figured out a way to do it where they're just all natural wood. Because behind these curved parts, there's actually loads of nails in there. It's a real mess and that's one of the reasons why I painted them white. <laughs> um, but this time I figured out how to do it where it's all, all natural. So. And, and for me, that's a nice, if it's there, I like to see it, you know, the idea of painting them black and just having them there like that, is, that doesn't appeal to me so much, but yeah. In these drivers, there's actually a guy in America who owns a lot of the old equipment, that, that company Altec, and he's the only person still building them. And he's, yeah, hopefully gonna be doing them for a while. I mean, a lot of things like this worry me about a lot of things, you know, though it's a diminishing kind of uh, industry or whatever. So it's, it relies on people's passion to keep things going, I think, and it's not just my passion to put this stuff together. It's, it relies on the people who helped me, the, the, the people who supply things like this, you know, um, and they're trying to achieve something different to what the, the mainstream commercial solutions are, which is, is really interesting. And I think one guy who helped me loads with this was a guy called Scott Fitlin from America. And, uh, and he was the guy from New York, in fact. I don't, I, know, I don't know New York, I've never been. I'm sure some of you have. You might have heard of a place called Coney Island, off of New York, and there's a bumper car ride there, yeah? And this guy has a sound system and a bumper car ride, that's what he did for decades, yeah? But he used to know some of these people that we were just talking about, Richard Long and uh, Alex Rosner and stuff, and he helped me loads online, and uh, he sadly died about seven years ago, I think. Um, and, and before he, he died, actually, on, on, online, a lot of, a lot of, you know, it's interesting that a few people can kind of support this knowledge moving forward. So I learned the majority of what I learned about the very particular style of putting a sound system together from, from a couple of people, maybe, you know. And there was, there was a guy called Shorty who, who, who then commercialized and set up a company based on a lot of this. And... And he was interested in controlling then and taking off a lot of the information from all sorts of places. And, and this other guy who helped me adore, uh, also did this because people fell out with each other and just generally had a massive strop with each other, all fell out, deleted an absolute wealth of information that had helped me do this. And you know, I was just really privileged to get the time of this guy from New York when I did. It, a, lo a lot of people come and ask me about getting a, a Bozak mixer or l l finding out about certain things. And I genuinely think, like, when I, I was lucky to start trying to learn it at a time when there were certain people out there who would take me under their wing and show me. And if I was trying to do the same again, even five years later or ten years later as it is now or whatever, it'd really be a struggle. So I'm particularly interested in ways that we can keep these very specific ways of doing things going, because you know they'll easily be gone and then it'll all just be like boom, function one or boom, you know, 
big sound systems and, and, and festivals and big clubs, and we'll lose a lot of the, the smaller stuff, you know? That's important to me to figure out how to do that sort of stuff because, you know, when we talk about, like, New York in the late 70s and early 80s in the recording industry, they'd reached a peak of analog technology that hasn't been surpassed since. And, and when it's gone, it's gone because back then there was big companies making millions and millions of dollars off of it, and now they're making fuck all off it. So there's no way to pay people to learn this stuff. And when it is gone, and if it was another discipline, yeah, if it was like a tapestry that was falling apart somewhere, there'd be people putting money into, there'd be people studying it. It'd be getting recorded how this is done. And, and I really feel with audio, that's something that's not done. And people at universities and rah, rah, rah need to sort their stuff out and, and get some of it get some of it recorded, you know, especially working with a lot of the engineers that I have the privilege of working with, people who fix studio stuff and, you know, th they'll, they'll be gone in a, a decade, two decades, and then it'll just be idiots like me. Nah, there's, actually, there's loads of young people who know really what they're doing loads with that sort of stuff, but I think it's really important to sort of collectively say, are we going to store some of this information before it's gone? Like we would if it was some other arts discipline. And sometimes I feel like this doesn't get the respect that's needed. Yeah, I'm not, I guess people come here and they think, oh, it's like a vinyl only, rah, rah, rah. But I've, I've always played digital stuff on it. And I'll keep it analog if I can, because I love that. Um, but, you know, it's not like a complete, dogmatic rule for me, because if there's a banging tune and it's just not on vinyl, I'm not going to not play it because they didn't put it out on vinyl. That'd be crazy. Um, I just think the thing maybe about just using just digital is it's easier to just move without realizing you've moved there towards a complete piece of shit, you know, and, and it just sounds rubbish and you've lost everything. Um, so you just, it's about balance, isn't it? You know? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely loads to learn on new technology. Too much for me, anyway. Um, I guess, you know, you've, at the time when I started building the sound system, there was plenty of new technology available, and I took a very specific decision that I was inspired by something that I'd seen, and I made a leap of faith to try and achieve that. And, and, and when we were like, oh, you know, it seemed like it worked. I'd, created something that was different to what other people were doing and people were like, oh, that's great, that is well done, keep up the good work, so here we are now. And I guess I went down a route that's very specific, you know, very singular in a way and I just kind of tried to get good at that and had people help me, but I know there's a whole world of other, other options out there, you know. Um, but at the same time, I do wish there was more sound systems like this and little venues. I wish I could go, uh, you know, I wish I could go right now to to Bradford or to, to Manchester or Birmingham or even, you know, London needs some plastic people. Someone please sort it out so there's somewhere nice to go in London that's like that. Is it good, yeah? Right. Spirit land, yeah? yeah? It is a good system, but if you go to plastic people and it was that, this is an interesting thing for me, like, I want it where like an 18 year old kid can walk into a room, yeah, and they don't have to spend like eight quid on a gin and tonic or something, yeah? I want it where they can walk in and they can just have this they can appreciation of music and they can be hit by the music and it's not about being in a venue that's really fucking expensive. And, and I see that hi-fi stuff, but I want it to be like when you walk into a dark club and uh, experience music and it's just like, it's physical, but it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing and you can really, people can have their opinions really changed really quickly by going into the right environment. And you know, I, when I was young and I went into Plastic People, that switched things up for me. And I really want people who you know, are 20 years old now to be able to go somewhere and experience that. It just doesn't work very well commercially, does it, doing these small things? It's better to be bigger. But anyway, I tell you what, I'm pretty much going to leave it there unless anyone's got a really good question. Thank you very much for uh, coming and seeing me ramble awkwardly in front of some massive floodlights. <laughs>